Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to announce some upcoming webinars that I'll be conducting. There will be two three-part webinars, the first of which is intended for former cult members or people who were in relationships with controllers or narcissists who are looking for deeper insight into their healing process. The second series is for the families and friends of those who have been in those kinds of environments and want to understand how to help support their loved ones and also how they can cope with these difficult moments and stresses placed on these relationships with their loved ones. The first of the three-part series for former members will premiere Thursday, September 8th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. At the same time of day, the following two Thursdays as well, the 15th and the 22nd. The second webinar intended for families and friends will premiere Thursday, October 6th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And at the same time of day, the following two Thursdays, October 13th and October 20th. These first rounds of webinars are going to be premiered live, so you'll be able to ask questions in the chat that I will then answer at the end during the Q&A session. The individual cost for these three-part webinars is $150 U.S. dollars. The bundle price for both webinars is $250 U.S. dollars. If you're unable to attend live, the webinars will be available for purchase through my website, rachelbernsteintherapy.com or on our Vimeo page, where you can download or stream them anytime. You can find the link in the show notes of this episode. Each meeting will be one hour long, a 45-minute presentation with 15-minute Q&A. I truly look forward to speaking with all of you in a new and more intimate way. Stay tuned for more similar offerings as we are planning to launch many, many more video lectures on various subjects, all of which will be available for download and streaming anytime. You can find more information on my website. Thank you and be well. Today on the show, we get to have another episode about the troubled teen industry. It's a very important subject to me. I see the fallout from it quite a lot. And again, it's not to say that all teen treatment programs are bad. They are not. But for so long, they have been unregulated. And for so long, there has been a monopoly on some of these places by some families, by some professionals who don't know anything about anything, but they do know actually how to abuse their power. And so a lot of very well-meaning parents will spend sometimes their last pennies on sending their kids to a place that turns out to be run by people who are not qualified in any way and who may have also been sent from one place to the next because they were accused of things at the last place. So, as always, do your research as much as you can, even though I know having a child who you feel is in danger or who has sort of pushed you to the brink is going to make you feel like you need to find something and find something fast. Slow down long enough to find out about the place, to your satisfaction, to make sure it's safe. Julianne Bull is a licensed marriage and family therapist living in Los Angeles. She holds a master's in marriage and family therapy from the University of California and has been practicing for about seven years. She often works with adolescents and is also a certified animal-assisted therapy professional. At age 14, Julianne was sent away for a year to two different troubled teen industry programs. The experiences are the ones which inspired her to become a therapist for teens and to use her work to fight against this damaging and dangerous industry. Here's Julianne now. I am so happy to have Julianne Bull with me today. Your story is so significant and important, and it is tied in with what I hope is this wave of knowledge, insight, the behind the scenes, that, you know, shedding a light on something where 
it had remained in the darkness way too long. And being able to also talk from a different perspective to not only what you experienced, but how it impacts you now and affects the decisions you make and the work that you do and sort of that whole chronology of the impact and how it informs you in your life now and your work now. I'm very interested in hearing all about that. So let me hand it over to you and you can say hello and introduce yourself any way you would like, and then we'll start chatting. Yeah, so I'm Julianne Bull. I am an LMFT and I'm practicing um, pretty much virtually right now in California, but I work pretty predominantly with teens. And I am also a survivor of the troubled teen industry, which is what I am here to talk about. Definitely informs my clinical work with teens and is why I wanted to get into therapy because that was sort of my first introduction to therapy was in those programs. So that's an interesting thing. So yeah, and I am trying now to get more involved in, as you said, as this wave happens and we're starting to talk about it, I want to put my voice out there. Wow. Have you been able to do that so far? And I wonder what the experience has been like for you and the responses that you've gotten. Yeah. The first thing I ever put out was on the I Got Out org Instagram because they were doing a a focus for the month on the troubled teen industry. And that was the first time I've ever really put anything out there, their difference in the family. And The response was really surprising. I just wasn't expecting people to, that many people to read it or to care or, you know, to resonate with it. And I think it really helped me understand how much this movement has grown in the last year and that people really are tuning in. And the other thing that's been wonderful is just the community of people who are interested in cults and working with deprogramming and all that stuff, sort of co-opting this and taking it under their wing, I think has been a huge help because we were sort of alone in the wilderness, no pun intended. (laughs) Um, So having that community come in and, and care about it has been really huge. I love that you mentioned that because one of the things that I think makes any field dynamic is when you incorporate new information into it, when it fits under that rubric, under that heading. And a lot of the times that I've expanded my practice and realized I now have a wider net than I did before was from being informed by other people who said, I've seen your definition of this. It actually applied to my marriage. (laughs) What is that? Right. Or that applied to my teen treatment program or my conversion therapy, uh, my narcissistic parent and my 12 step program at times, right? Like, you know, pros and cons, again, not making an overall statement about all of them, but that there can be elements that you want to overlap. Right, exactly. So I think it's really great that we've been able to kind of merge in, in that we can offer the terminology from our field, right? Into the, let's understand what happened here and why. And and also then being able to define what was so wrong about it. Just like when people are raised in a cult and they see how they were raised as children. And then when they leave and they become parents of their own, they think, I could never have let that happen or been okay with the following things. I mean, who knows in hindsight, but still that's, it affects them more deeply. So I think you now as a mental health professional, you're thinking, oh, wow, given this person sitting in front of me, there are things that I would never dare say or do to this person that were done to me, not just professional sense, but your conscience would stop you. And I think then it it kind of illuminates how wrong it was. Yeah. And I think even just having that terminology come into the conversation helped me view it differently as a survivor. You know, people are using language and I'm like, I never considered this a cult, but now that people are talking about it and applying terms to it and, and the discussion we're having, I see that element of it now. And it's, it's totally shifted my perspective. Right. And, you know, and people will sometimes say, well, is it exactly a cult? Is it not? Whatever. I don't know if that, if it matters to that degree, like let's share what we've come to learn about how manipulation takes place and what you call that technique. And let's see which one of those applies to this. Exactly. Okay. So then let's get to know you and where this all started. So I first got sent away when I was 14 and I always want to include the, that there were definitely elements at home that lead, you know, always to lead to being sent away. Like there's stuff happening. It doesn't just happen out of nowhere. So there was a lot of, you know, tumultuousness in my family and and my stepmom and I were having a very hard time getting along. And that was sort of what led to the decision. So the first place I went was in Utah and it's still operating. So I don't use the name of it because, you know, 
they like to be litigious. So I was there for a summer and um, it was it was basically, you know, a lot of these places are wilderness programs. It wasn't that in the sense that we were out in the wilderness with a backpack on, but it was a working cattle ranch. So you were getting up at five in the morning and working the ranch. And there was a lot of manual labor and um, things that children should not be doing. So I was there for three months and I'm just giving you the quick synopsis, you know, we can go into more detail, obviously. And then left and they don't really do a very good job of reintegrating the family. They don't prepare you for going back to normal life. They don't prepare you for um, living with the people who sent you there again and how hard that's going to be. And they don't really just prepare any skills or tools or communication. So we had a really hard time readjusting to living together, me and my parents. And they were really encouraged to utilize a lot of the same punishments that had been used at the program when I got home, which yeah, obviously did not go well. So, you know, I, if I did something wrong, I was sent out to sit in the backyard for six hours, the way I would have been in an impact circle in Utah, just as an example. Can I just ask what you mean by doing something wrong? How would that have been defined? (laughs) I wish it had been a clear definition. (laughs) Um, Just anything where, you know, we would normally get into conflict. They basically now had a tool. So if my stepmom and I got in an argument, if my homework wasn't done, something like that, they now had a, a resource, basically a consequence that they could turn to. So understandably, that did not go very well. And we didn't coexist for much longer. And the same overhead program that ran the Utah place had another school. I mean, they have tons, but they recommended this school to my parents, like send her here. It's kind of the next step up, right? So that was in Vermont. It was a boarding school, um, but it was a lockdown facility. We weren't, we didn't leave the premises. We didn't, you know, nobody came in, nobody went out. And I was there for about a year. It was different. <laughs> it was equally challenging. Um, when I started there, there were 12 girls. When I left, there were 30. And they had changed the rules by the time I left so that you weren't, your parents weren't able to pull you out anymore. You had to graduate by their terms. And so um, I was pretty much going to be there until I was 18. But I, I happened to have an unsupervised phone call with my mom one day and told her the truth of everything that was going on there. And she got on a plane and she came on my 16th birthday. She told them we were just going out to dinner and she drove me to the airport. Right on. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. This, so far, this is my favorite part of your story. <laughs> Me too. That was my sweet 16. Spent in a hotel room, scared that they were going to come knock down the door and find us. But yeah, and then I, I moved to Florida and I that was the end of it. But it was about, yeah, a year and a half of my life that was just gone. You said something about having an unsupervised phone call. Mm-hmm. Something that people don't realize about these places is that there is no private communication allowed and everything is listened in on or, you know, kind of scripted. And then it seems that there's a reward or punishment system based on if you follow along with how they tell you to say it. So parents, to a great degree, are kept in the dark. You have to deal with the fact that you're lying to them in order to just survive the day while you're there. I mean, it that it's uh, uh, there's so many of these moments. I know that wasn't a word, that was a sound, but I make that sound a lot when I think about that being backed into a corner in that way, you know, having to lie to your parents in order to survive where you are. I mean, it shows what's wrong. Yeah. Do you remember what happened during that unsupervised phone conversation, what you told her? Yeah, I do. Um, We had had two girls attempt suicide and nothing had really been done about it. I don't want to get too graphic, but I just remember seeing them in the hallway with bandages on and no one was doing anything other than monitoring them. They couldn't go in their room. They had to sit in the hallway and that's like the extent of what was done to take care of them. And self-harm had become really popular. Everyone was just in a really bad place at that time. And my best friend there had just left. And so I was also in a really bad place. And I just told her, girls are attempting suicide. I'm thinking about self-harming. I really don't know how much longer I'm going to make it here. And that's how I felt at the time. You know, I really felt like I, I certainly can't do this until I'm 18. I don't know how much longer I can. And she had never heard anything like that. Because like you said, they're keeping parents completely in the dark. And I think that's a really important part of the conversation to have, because I think it's really easy, especially like when I tell friends and stuff, they just immediately want to demonize my parents, right? Like, how could they do that? I could never. 
And I understand that perspective, but I don't think people understand how much they are also a victim in this, that they're being lied to, they're being manipulated, they're being presented something that should exist, but doesn't. <laughs> like residential programs for teens who are struggling should, in theory, be a thing if run by the right people and staffed by clinicians. Yes, it doesn't exist. You've had religious organizations come in and fill that void. So it's very much like a snake oil salesman situation. And I still see that with parents now where they'll start looking into these places. And I have to be like, actually, I know that should exist. And in theory, it would be great. What you're looking at is not what you're looking for. So, so I think it's, I think that's really a really important piece is that our parents most of the time do not know the extent of what's going on and how you're being treated. So as soon as she knew she was on a plane, you know. And the power of that, just knowing that when she knew she came to rescue you, I mean, what did that do for your relationship with each other? Um, I had never lived with my mom prior to that. So it was a huge turning point for both of us. It was a big adjustment. She moved out when I was three. So it was suddenly we're living together. (laughs) And I'd had a very difficult relationship with her. She had really severe postpartum depression after I was born. So we'd had a a difficult relationship. And so suddenly she's really showing up as a parent in this life-saving way. She wasn't as involved in the decision to send me away as my dad and my stepmom were. So it was sort of a weird place that she was in and all of it where she's just kind of signing things and doesn't really know where I'm going. And is just like, well, they know best. So yeah, I think we got obviously a lot closer through that. And that's something that I'm always going to be really thankful to her for. I don't even think she understands the extent of how that changed the trajectory of my life. But she's to this day, one of the only people I can talk to about that experience. And she'll listen to the truth of it and what actually happened and not try to change the story. Wow. I'm so glad that you had this person who kind of represented a safer connection and that she responded. Yeah. How powerful. You know, when you're talking about parents being kept in the dark, I will sometimes tell people to be wary of um, any residential center or drug treatment center where there are only one stars or there are only five stars. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because there are a lot of people I've talked to who said we weren't allowed to leave or we weren't allowed to ha- to eat that day. I mean, depending on the place until we gave a rating of five stars and we wrote up a wonderful review or we had our parents do it. So do your research, talk to people who have been in it, talk to people who have left it. Don't just go by what they're posting online or who they're shaking hands with. And I remember there are a lot of places that got their credibility because, you know, the the person in charge was shaking the hand of Dr. Phil. Dr. Oh, Dr. <laughs> can we just talk about Dr. Phil for a minute? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Dr. Phil is, you know, known for sending a lot of people to a lot of these places. Yeah. Mine is one of them. I do wonder when the blowback for that will ever happen. But yes, I think, and also if there's a void of information, I think that's really important too, because they really kept things very tight. You know, we weren't allowed to use technology at pretty much either of the places. Uh, The first place I couldn't use the phone, it was letters and they would read them ahead of time. And the second place was only the phone and it was supervised. We didn't go on the internet, nothing. So there was no way to be getting any kind of information to anybody. And then once you get out, you just sort of hear how litigious these places are, how much they come after anybody who speaks out. If you go in some of the communities, and I think this is common for a lot of places where people get out, that other people will try to silence you. You know, other survivors will, the ones who went through it and feel like it worked for them, which is a similar, again, similar to cult language, right? Will start to come at you. And before there was any of this breaking code silence or any of these organizations that talked about this, it was only groups for people who had been to the program. And it was anybody's opinion was welcome. And so I remember trying to speak up in those communities and people would just be like, it changed my life. You did it wrong. You obviously like didn't try or you were just too bad for them to fix or whatever. And that's very hard in any kind of setting where you're trying to reconcile your own trauma and you're trying to understand what happened to you, to have other people who went through the same thing basically silence you. So there was no way to talk about any of these places at all until very recently. I'm wondering if you can, first of all, let us know what the catalyst was for you to be sent there to begin with. And then I'm curious about the first place, and then we can talk about the second place. 
So for me, it wasn't any of the normal things. It wasn't drug addiction. It wasn't alcohol addiction. It wasn't sex addiction. It wasn't anything. It was difficulties at home. Like I said, my parents got divorced when I was three. They both got remarried the same year. So I immediately had two brand new step parents and all sorts of stuff changed really fast. As a result, I had a really difficult relationship with my stepmom that lasted for years. It reflected in my schoolwork, I started to struggle in school. She had me go to the high school she went to instead of the one that all my friends went to and didn't have my friends anymore. I was at this all girls Catholic school. I'd been in public school my whole life. So I started to fail out of school. You know, it's difficult because again, there's the perspective, which is what most people have of, I could never do that to my kid, no matter what happened. And I totally get that. And at the same time, I've had to do a ton of work of understanding why my parents made that decision so that we can all heal and move forward. And I do understand it, again, from the lens of your kid is flunking out of school, you're fighting with them every day, everyone in the house is miserable, you feel hopeless. You know, I work with parents now that get to that place and they feel hopeless and you don't know where to turn. I mean, getting any kind of mental health care for a minor is nearly impossible in this country. Try to find them a hospital bed, you know, good luck. So again, I think that there was a void that there still is. And you go online and you look for something and this is what pops up. And so it presents itself as your kid's going to come and they're going to live on a ranch with animals and they're going to have a therapist every day that's going to help them. And they're going to learn all these essential life skills and they're going to come back to you a new kid. And I think that sounded very attractive to them at a time that we were basically not on speaking terms and I was going to flunk out of school. So... That's sort of what led to it. And I got lucky in that a lot of people, and I don't know how many people know this, but a lot of people who get sent to these places get abducted out of their homes. They don't go willingly, obviously. And so two strangers come in and pull you out of your bed and you're on a plane. I got lucky in that that didn't happen to me because my understanding was that I was going to summer camp. And so I didn't put up a fight (laughs) because that sounded fine. It was presented as summer camp with therapy. And I'm like, great, sounds fun. Yeah, I know that the whole abduction part, you know, people do think that it's that's something that happened in yesteryear, but it's still happening today. And for for anyone out there listening, uh, that becomes part of the trauma. Yes. And then exactly going back to something that I hope we touch on again, this idea of living again with the people who sent you there, also living with the people who allowed strangers to come and grab you and take you and yeah, all of it gets added to how how now do I trust these people ever again? So tell me about this summer camp. What was it like when you first got there? What was your impression? So I did get a little taste of the strangers in that um, my stepfather flew me to Las Vegas and that's where the strangers picked me up. So I wasn't abducted, but I spent most of the journey with people I didn't know. So we drove from the Las Vegas airport to the middle of nowhere in Utah. They stopped at In-N-Out on the way. They stopped and got me snacks and treats. And it seemed like this is going to be great. And I still don't quite know what the motivation for that was. I They were like outsourced contractors who did this. They didn't work with the program. So I don't know if they just felt bad and wanted to treat you before your life is stripped away from you. It was very bizarre. <laughs> But I get there and they immediately take all your things, I guess, to sort through them to make sure there's no weapons or contraband. Took my shoes. <laughs> and I distinctly remember like a donkey walking up to the car and like sniffing through my stuff because it was just a wild donkey. And I'm like, where am I? What is going on? <laughs> like, what is happening? And then they put us in what are called impact circles, which is a really important part of the story. So it's basically a rock circle in the dirt with a little tarp over a stick and a little fire pit. And you go sit in there. I sat probably two or three hours before anyone came to talk to me at all. And at that time they told me you're in this circle to detox. And I'm like, I'm not on anything. I don't, there's nothing to detox from. And it's like, doesn't matter. You're detoxing from your thoughts. You're thinking about what you've done to get here. You're going to be in here for the next three days. I think that was when I realized I'm not at camp. So you do go inside at night, you sleep on the floor indoors, I guess, to protect you from the elements, but then at sunrise, you're back out in the circle. And I think it was on the first day that I just had an epic panic attack. I mean, I just started completely freaking out because I realized what was happening (laughs) and I didn't know how long I was going to be there. And, you know, just 
please, can I call my dad? And they had to send my, that was the first time I met my therapist because they had to send the therapist to come calm me down. Because again, everyone else had had, you know, they'd been abducted from their beds. They'd had the flight. They'd had all this time to understand what was happening. I'm now being hit with it in real time, you know? So I remember that sort of being like when the therapist came to talk to me and basically told me, we're not contacting your parents. That was the first moment of trauma. Like if I could ever remember a moment where trauma happened in real time, that was it. Just this primal fear of realizing that no one's coming to help you. I can't describe that to people. It's, it it was the scariest thing I've ever felt. And I wrote a letter to my parents. They said I could write a letter. So I wrote a letter and I, my mom told me later because they didn't understand the extent of what was going on. And they thought I was being dramatic they all poured margaritas and read the letter together and laughed about it. You know, just thinking that I'm being really dramatic and this is just truly, and you know. So the impact circles are really important because they become a form of punishment for the rest of the program. Like that is always your threat is that you're going to go back to that. You're in it for three days when you start and then you're kind of integrated into the first level, which was you live in a cabin, you don't have electricity, you don't have water, you know, so you're really living off the land. And that's when you start doing the chores and doing the labor. And I remember my chore was to (laughs) get water from the creek in buckets to feed to the Clydesdale horses, which are huge. I was 87 pounds soaking wet when I got there. (laughs) And it would take me like three or four hours to fill the trough because every time I would come up there and pour water and they'd drink it. So I'd have to go do it again. And so that was like my main chore. And I just remember constantly being put down and belittled because I didn't do it fast enough. And I would come back soaking wet. And, you know, it's like, I'm this big and they're massive horses and I don't know what to tell you. So it's a lot of that, you know, it's a lot of labor. It's a lot of trying to break you. The purpose of that level of the program is to break your spirit. Like that's just, I don't see any other purpose to it. This idea where they said you're going to be detoxing. I find this so interesting. There are a lot of people who have their kids in programs that are for anxiety, depression, other sorts of things, not necessarily with substances, but the model that's used is the 12-step model. So the language that's used, they it's like they work it into fitting, but it doesn't. And so that phrase, you're going to be detoxing from your thoughts. What? That means nothing. And what's wrong with your thoughts? And why do you have to get rid of them? And so it's like, they're trying to make it work, but it's a square peg round hole issue. And I think it's really, really wrong. And it's also confusing because then like, what, why do I need to get rid of my thoughts? Okay. So you're feeding, you're, you're, you're helping the Clydesdale horses get water and you're being berated for not doing it fast enough, not doing it well enough. What happens after that? So you're ideally there for about a month doing just branch work. And the goal is that you're going to this place called the barn, which is down the street and it has electricity and water and, you know, all the luxuries of modern life. So everyone's trying to work toward that. And you are doing a binder of paperwork that does feel very 12 steppy. It's all very like think about what you did and how are you going to be better when you get back and just, you know, soul searching paperwork. So part of that paperwork is a task to complete a bow drill, which is for people who don't know, you take a bow, like a bow and arrow, and you wrap a stick in the string and then you use the friction to make an ember basically. So you can make a fire. It's like a boy scout technique. So I get to that point And again, I'm 87 pounds soaking wet at this point. I do not have the arm strength to do this. After about two days of failing, they put me back in the impact circle. My entire day was sitting in solitary confinement and then trying to do the bow drills. And it took me, I remember, 14 days to be able to even get one and you needed five. So I I had kind of a unique experience in that way because I should have been participating, but I was just stuck in confinement because of this one thing. I still don't know why. (laughs) I don't know why I couldn't have just been like, well, that one will give you a different task. I don't know, but that was what happened. So eventually I completed it. And then you go on like a wilderness. 
I can only describe it as like a spirit walk because they're co-opting a Native American tradition for this, where you do, you go into the woods and you, you know, you try to like, they're using that language, try to go on a spirit walk and find your inner spirit animal and figure out, you know, what your path is ahead of you. And that's the only way to get to the barn is to do this like weird day in isolation in a little cabin by yourself and try to find your, I don't even know what. So I did that and then went up to the barn and the barn is levels three and four. It's where you get your therapist. It's where you basically wake up in the morning, you get assigned a chore and a task for the day. And then that's your day. It was either clean the toilets and clean the kitchen, or it was, you know, do hay baling, which was really hard when you're small because they're like 200 pounds. One that was like a treat was if you got to go on a trail ride. So they that's when they started incorporating equine therapy. I should say that I had a really traumatic experience with a horse prior to this where I was thrown off and like kicked in the back several times and was phobic of horses when I got to this program. <laughs> So I was not super excited to see that I had been assigned a horse to take care of. And another weird thing about my experience there was that I was sort of labeled the problem one from the beginning. And so they gave me the most difficult horse to break in because I was like a problem child they needed to break. And so I still don't quite understand what that was. But I think it was just like I was not going to be brainwashed and I did not agree with their techniques and I was fighting them every step of the way. <laughs> My mom was joking recently. She's like, you couldn't join a cult because they wouldn't be able to break you. <laughs> this place couldn't break you. I'll say my most memorable story is that I, one day we got to go on a hike and it was like an eight hour hike to the highest point in that area of the state. And halfway through the hike, we sat down to rest and I sat on a cactus because I just wasn't looking where I was sitting. The guy who was leading us, one of the staff members, took me behind a rock formation with several of the other kids and used his knife to get some of the needles off and then just like pulled my pants down on the side of the mountain and was using his knife to try to get the needles off. And I'm like humiliated, obviously, because there's other kids looking at me and, you know. So we do the rest of the hike, a lot of which was too steep to walk down. So I had to slide down on my bottom. My jeans ripped open. Then they told me I was being indecent, so I had to cover up. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I was never taken to a doctor. They took me to the vet in town, and that was the only person that ever saw me. And they basically said, yeah, those are going to be stuck in there for a long time. And they were. It was 10 years before <laughs> that all finished. So, like, no medical care. So it's a lot of chores. It's a lot of ranch work. Then you, you're you working toward level four, which is, like, that's the level you have to be on to graduate. And here's where some of the misogyny comes in. When the boys get to level four, they get to go live in a separate cabin, a really nice one with a television, like decked out puppies and cereals of their choice, like things we weren't allowed to eat or do or any of that. When the girls got to level four, they went and lived with an ex-Marine drill sergeant at her house and got up at four in the morning to cook the meals for everybody that was there. So like a hundred people. So there wasn't a lot of incentive right. <laughs> on my side to get to level four. I'm sure. And I had a very hard time maintaining it. I didn't want to stay with her. I felt uncomfortable with her, you know, the drill sergeant. And <laughs> I kept dropping off level four because I'm like, I will not be in that house. I don't, I don't want to get up and cook for everybody. How is that a reward? So basically the way that I got out of this place was because my parents you know, they were saying she needs to stay here longer. We haven't been able to get through to her. And my parents are like, she starts school. It's September. We're coming to get her. And so they put me on level four for the day, the day that I graduated because my parents were coming either way. So I didn't technically graduate. <laughs> I just, I stubborned my way out. Uh-huh. You stubborned your way out. I love that. <laughs> when you talk about being mistreated and singled out, for more mistreatment, not only the, the misogyny that the girls are singled out uh, on mass, which is horrible, but people who can't be broken really piss off the people there. Yeah. I don't know how to say it in a more yeah. kind of clinical way, but it, t- it pisses them off because that's the task they've been given. And that's what I think makes them feel powerful and makes them feel like they're doing their job. And if you don't let them do their job because you're going to hold on to your self-esteem, God forbid, they get very frustrated with you. There are a lot of people I work with who 
wanted to leave a group and will say that it was as soon as they stopped being afraid of the leader and they stopped being influenced and they started to kind of regain a sense of themselves and they were done, that that's when the group turned the heat up on them. And so usually people who have just come out of a cult have just come through a fire that was raging. I mean, it was already, there were embers the whole time, but then they went through a raging fire right before getting out. So they're traumatized by that. Yeah, I think that's very accurate. Wow. So then, okay, so they came to get you. What was said to your parents about you or what you needed? Were they given marching orders for you? I remember we had like a last group therapy session with me and my parents and my therapist, who I didn't trust at all because she told my parents everything I said the entire time I was there. So great. So zero confidentiality. Right. So who is this therapy for? Uh, And that's my first exposure to therapy, which is not great either. But we had this group therapy session where they were basically encouraging my parents to continue the program when we got home because I hadn't completed it. I hadn't graduated. So again, keep implementing the impact circle when she gets home. That seemed to be the most effective thing for her because it was, it made me come out of my skin because it's solitary confinement and that's what that does. But basically any way they could replicate the program at home was encouraged because I, they didn't feel I had changed at all. And then it was try that for a few months. And if not, we have another place she can go. And that's exactly what happened. And the lack of insight there on their part is that maybe you didn't change because you didn't need to. (laughs) Yeah. Or because something was wrong in the environment that wasn't being addressed, you know, maybe there's family issues. Right. Exactly. But so that was never dealt with. No. Okay. So driving back with your parents. (laughs) Yeah. What was that like? They tried to make it a vacation. So we went to the national park. I was so dissociated. I have vague memories, but mostly it's been told to me what that was like. I guess we went to Vegas for a day or something and or stayed a little bit outside Vegas and had dinner and I was checked out. And I think that's when it, my brain first started learning what dissociation was and how to do it in really stressful moments. But yeah, I, I remember the next few months being really difficult. I remember us not getting along at all and nothing had improved. And I was very angry at them, obviously, and there was no trust anymore. And then implementing the impact circle at home is not going to help anything. You know, it's just like re-traumatization constantly from my parents, which is a whole other thing. So yeah, it was a, it was a bad time. Oh, so I'm curious just before we move forward, what was it like for you socially? I mean, here you're talking about your interactions with the staff and then with your parents after. But what about with the other people who were there? It was difficult. I remember there was a girl that I really didn't get along with and it got to the point that they like tied us together to spend the days together so that we would learn to get along literally with rope. And she got so mad at me at one point that she just like yanked it and like my jeans ripped and I was really upset because those are my only pair of jeans. And that's like the only socialization I remember. I don't remember anything positive. I remember we weren't allowed to speak to the boys at all. We weren't even allowed to make eye contact. If we, the only times we kind of overlapped were when we did our school. <laughs> I put that in big quotes, which was just sitting in a room with an old guy supervising and reading books. I mean, we weren't really getting anything done, but that was the only time we interacted with the boys at all. I just, yeah, I remember it being a very isolative experience as opposed to the next place I went. It was, you're very converged with other people and there was a lot of dynamics, but this place, I I remember feeling very on my own the whole time. Okay. Okay. Did you want your folks to know about what had happened to you? I mean, I know you were checked out and dissociating, which I understand, but at some point, did you want them to hear the stories? I did, but I think I got the message pretty clear that they weren't interested. I mean, at a certain point, it was implemented that they didn't want to hear anything negative about these places anymore. That was like a rule. I remember when I was in Vermont, if I called them, I couldn't say anything negative. I don't know how early on that got implemented, but I know the the implicit message was there that we're not interested. I mean, they were very bought into the program. It was like all that brainwashing and programming had worked on them. So it was, you know, if she says this or that, it's because she's rebelling and whatever. So it was just anything I had to say was discredited. And I also think 
I didn't recognize how bad it was because you're spending three months with people telling you you're the problem. You know, the program's not the problem. You're the problem. Something's wrong with you. I didn't see it as the program was wrong and something bad was done to me until much later in life. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually going to ask if your self-concept had shifted at all based on what they had wanted to convince you was true about you. I think it did in that... (sighs) I want to say I could recognize that the program was really messed up and that I didn't agree with their practices. And I didn't obviously didn't let them (laughs) get in my head that way. But I think by that point, it was so ingrained in me that I was like a problem child, that that just felt like my identity. That part I didn't question. So you start back at school. Mm -hmm. Did you find yourself feeling really different going back into a school environment? I mean, you had had a very different summer than a lot of your peers. So what was that like for you? Again, it was a brand new school. I barely knew these people. So I didn't tell people that much. But I remember like my friends that I had gone to school with K through eight, I had a really hard time knowing how to tell them, what to tell them. One of them I still talk to to this day. And she's like, I remember you telling me about it, but like you were being very vague and I didn't really understand where you had been or what you were talking about. So I think socially, I didn't know how to navigate it. It was like, how do you explain that to anybody? And and then there's the shame element where you're like, I'm a bad kid and I got sent to bad kid prison and that's embarrassing, you know? So don't really want to advertise that. Right, no, no. And I'm wondering also just going in with that concept, I'm a bad kid, if that impacted how much you felt like you deserved, you know, to be treated a certain way or to be able to have new friendships. I think it definitely did. And I... I also think like in terms of schoolwork, I had just, I had just given up on myself at that point. It's like so many people had told me I wasn't going to have a future that it was like, okay, I'm not going to have a future. Why try? So then I guess on the first place's recommendation, they send me to another school within the overhead, you know, education group that runs all these places, a Mormon run organization as they often are. So the second place was in Vermont, but Still, all the staff was Mormon, same as in Utah, which was interesting. And that place has since been shut down, actually, for sexual misconduct uh, from teachers. I wish I found that surprising. So getting there is, again, another thing that I was just checked into another hotel down the street. I don't remember. I... I'm sure we discussed it and I know that we got on a plane and I know that we stayed in a hotel and we'd even visited a few months prior, just for like a couple days, just to like scope out that place and another place. So I had seen it before. It was a similar thing where they took all my stuff. They, you know, I knew the drill. They go through everything. They take your shoelaces. They give you new clothes to wear. And then my parents left. I tried for a couple hours to get to know the other girls, you know, get to know my room placement and my roommates and make the best of it because I had known it was coming. Um, but then I started having a panic attack again. They did let me call my parents this time. I vividly remember being like huddled under a desk on the phone with them, like shaking. My dad was still at the hotel. He could have turned around and gotten me. You know, that was sort of my thinking is like, they're still in town. They haven't gone on the plane yet. And I remember his response just being like, nope, we're not coming. This is it. And the first probably month were just riddled with anxiety. I was just, I always say coming out of my skin because that's how it feels when you're just at that level of anxiety that it's uncomfortable to exist within your body. It was a strange place. It was a former nursing home that had gone under and this place had bought it to make it a school. So it had like dorms, you know, on one side where like the residents would have lived and then it had a school side and then it had a dining hall and it was two people to a room. The days were different. It wasn't labor. It was schooling. But again, it's like what I'll say for their schooling is that my credits were not accepted at the next place I went because it was deemed not a school. So I had to repeat sophomore year and then a lot of therapy, you know, and again, another therapist that told my therapist, my parents, everything I said. So that was an interesting experience to be doing so much more therapy at this place than we were at the last place, but I still don't trust the therapist. It was interesting. Like there were just weird quirks. We weren't allowed to leave the building, but we would go like on Tuesdays, there was a ski resort down the street and we would go there as like our PE. We would go skiing. That was kind of the only time we left. I mean, there was a bookstore in town they would let us go to, but we had no money. So the shoplifting started really quickly and they had to nip that in the butt. <laughs> Basically, I was I was there for about a year and then things got really bad because they changed management. Like the heads of the school kind of left in the middle of the night and 
which was very weird. They like left with no word in the cover of darkness and we didn't know what was going on. And then new people came in and they didn't like the system where you got to graduate and leave. They wanted you to stay till you were 18 because that's cha-ching, you know? So the whole structure of the program changed, like what you were working toward changed. You had no motivation anymore because you couldn't just graduate out. You had to turn 18. So why try, you know? A lot more intensive like group therapy was happening now. And I remember a very long stretch where we didn't go anywhere outside the building at all for months. And people were starting to go really store crazy. I remember like trying to organize a trip to like go strawberry picking or something and pitching it to the principal like over and over and over, like, please just let us leave the building. And they wouldn't. And so that's when people started self-harming and getting really, you know, into really dark places mentally because we weren't, we were just imprisoned at that point. So yeah, I think it started to just get really strange. And I think that's part of why my mom wanted to come because it was like, this isn't what we signed up for. This isn't a whole new thing. She's not staying there until she's 18. <laughs> you know, I was only like 15. The idea that the people who ran it left like in the cover of night, I don't know this for a fact, but often that's when they're needing to run from the law. That's what it felt like. That's what that was our conspiracy theory. That very often is the case where suddenly someone has reported them and they know that the police are coming or that the media has been alerted and they're going to come to interview them or there's going to be an expose and suddenly they need to disappear. And then we'll often turn up in other places in another state or using a different name, you know, because this is often what they know how to do and how they know how to make a living. So they just pick up and do it somewhere else. But here to not be prepared, you know, here you're away from home. So the people in charge become kind of surrogate parental figures and suddenly they're missing and replaced with others. So just the insensitivity of that, it leaves people off balance. But then here you're teenagers with a lot of energy and you have no way to get it out. So it doesn't surprise me that there was self-harm. There's a lot of things that would definitely back up that theory. I mean, that we at one point absorbed another school that got shut down. Um, and so all these new people came in. That's when we went from 12 to 30. There were definitely whisperings. I don't know for a fact, but since this was eventually what they were shut down for, there were definitely whisperings of teachers being sexually inappropriate. I knew one girl for sure was telling us she was in a sexual relationship with a 60-year-old teacher who whose wife worked there. And in town, we were really, they did not like us. The town did not like us. They didn't want us there. We would get dirty looks when we went into town. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were complaints or people campaigning in town to get these like bad kids out of, out of our town. Yeah. I mean, in terms of like socialization and energy and stuff, I remember people started to just date each other because what else was there to do? And I remember a you know, obviously they did not like that. It was a Mormon run organization. They did not like any kind of homosexual activity happening. And so they sat us down and we had like a full sit down meeting about, they called us bugs by until graduation. And we're not interested in you guys becoming bugs. That's prohibited. It's disgusting. Don't do that here. If we catch you, blah, 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 insert X consequence. And I remember that being really hard on everybody because it's like all we have <laughs> at this point to do with our time is to try to date or, you know, and that just got taken away and really condemned and shamed. So now what? Right. So here, yeah, you're with other, you're with other girls. And it, it is natural at that age to want to be able to be physical, but also to want to be able to be soothed and to feel cared for and to feel held that you were not able to do that. And then that, that was sinful is such a crime on top of everything else that was happening, that there was no solace. So then you left at what point? I left on my 16th birthday. Right. So then your your mom comes to get you. How would you describe the, the kind of the shape that you were in at that point, physically, emotionally, if you can go back and remember it? I think I really believe I was dissociated for like a year after that. I don't remember a lot of things. I had no anxiety for the first time in my life because I was feeling nothing. My mom likes to say that people would walk into a room and I would growl at them. <laughs> <laughs> like I was just snarling at people. I had a lot of anger. I had nowhere to put it. They didn't get me into therapy for a while. 
And even when they did, I was so mistrusting of therapists at that point that I wasn't going to talk. And so I was a wreck and I had nowhere to put any of that energy. I talked to one person, um, my best friend that I mentioned before who had left. She was the only person I was in contact with that I could talk to about any of this. But the, the way I knew I was dissociated was I let her and two other people uh, pierce my ears with push pins, like from a bulletin board. And I'm someone who like the sight of blood, any needle, I'm passed out on the floor. So that that's how I knew how checked out I was that I was able to do that. And even when I got home, I'm like trying to pierce my nose in the bathroom with a safety pin. You know, I was just like anything to feel anything at that point. Right. Which is also part of the <laughs> self-harm that was taking place. Yes, absolutely. Wow. So when you said after you left, you didn't go for therapy for a while. And then when you did eventually, how did you figure out how to trust any therapist? So I ended up moving back to California when I was around 18 because I started to flunk out of college because I was in a bad way. And my dad basically called me up and was like, move back here. We'll set you straight. We'll get get you back on a path. Like basically start over, go to community college, get your GPA back up and start your life over. So I did move back. And then part of what we did to try to heal as a family and get my life back on track was to find me a therapist, which, you know, bless them that they recognized that because I was a mess. And I found a really, really incredible therapist. I mean, it was just luck of the draw. It was the first one we found. Um, her name was Shannon. And I was with her for 12 years. And she's actually the reason I became a therapist. She, I cannot understate how, or overstate how much she changed my life. I mean, and I think that what she proved was just she listened to me and then she didn't tell my parents what I was saying. And then we would have family sessions and she was really on my side. You know, she would, she would defend me and she would be the barrier between me and my dad's anger and just having someone show up and be there for me, be like a shield for me and, and care about me in that way was so transformative and new. People need these pivotal people in their lives that along the way gets you back on track. It moves you into a space where you feel safe and you can breathe again. We all need those. You mentioned about your father's anger. So what was that about? Because we haven't really talked about that. He had a rage problem my whole life. It got very volatile in the house. You know, it was a lot of screaming, a lot of name calling, a lot of like he broke my door in half one time, slamming it so hard. There's just, it was really intense and tumultuous. I think that when I got out of those programs, that anger started to couple with shame about the decisions they had made and bred new anger. <laughs> so we would get into these therapy sessions. And if I started speaking up at all about my experience, it was just like anger shut down. We're not going there. And Shannon really had to step in and defend me in those conversations because I was just trying to get a word in about my experience because they wouldn't hear me. It took years. I mean, it took years until we could have any kind of conversation about it. So what's it been like for you to be a clinician and what insight have you gotten about what happened to you, especially with the quote unquote therapy that you got and the kind of therapy that you provide now, what's different about it? I think the number one thing is I'm at a point now where I mainly work with teens, which is what I wanted. And I set really strong boundaries from the beginning with parents of, I make sure that the teen knows I'm on your side. You know, we're any, any way that your parents get looped in is going to be your consent. And you're going to know what we talked about. If it was without you in the room or they're going to be there, you know, there's not going to be anything happening behind your back. And I think that's been the number one thing because that's what was so important for me when I first started doing therapy for real. It's been an interesting thing. One of my first positions before I was even licensed was in an inner city high school. It was LAUSD, but kids who like hadn't been able to stay in the public school system and had to go to what was called a non-private school, non-public school, sorry. So it's basically just, you know, you were struggling in the public school system and you go to these, these kind of behavioral schools. Last place on earth that I expected this to be the first place that TTI comes up in my career, but multiple kids had just come out of a program before going to the school. And so we're coming into my office, starting to describe where they'd been all summer. And I'm like, oh my God, I know where you've been all summer, you know? And it was very shocking to me 
one, because when I was there, the demographic was basically rich white kids. You know, that's, that's who they go after. Those are the families that they're looking for. I did not know they had a presence with like underserved communities. I still don't know how that happens or if that's what they're targeting now or how these kids were getting sent there. But it was the same exact thing. It was, they were going to wilderness programs and, you know, I was in the wilderness all summer with a backpack on and it was a very interesting thing because I don't think I ever expected it to walk in my door. I expected to have to go seek that out, you know, like I'll label myself as a specialist with teens and then with behavior problems. And then that'll start to come to me. It just came to me unexpectedly before I was even licensed. So it was a very weird moment where I'm like, I have to work on this trauma right now because it's coming into my office. But it, but it really helped. I think it helped to work with those teens really early on and learn like, what do they need? What are they looking for? What are the boundaries that they respect and make them feel safe? And that's what I've been able to carry into private practice with teens is, you know, setting those boundaries really early on again. And I'm team you, you know, I'm not here for your parents and that's not how this is going to work. And parents don't like it, <laughs> but it's the only way to get them to open up because they've done the thing with their parents. You know, it didn't work. Two things that I wanted to ask you about. You started to talk about what you provide for teens. And I'm curious what teens need. You were saying about respecting their boundaries. What else do you let them know that you're going to be able to provide for them? I think they just need, I mean, this is the basis of therapy, right? But an objective third party that is not involved in what their parents want. And a lot of the times I feel like the attitude when parents come is sort of, we've done all we can do. Now it's your turn. You fix it, which is a great idea in theory, but not very realistic in practice because the whole family is involved in how we got here. But I think just having someone be like, that's not my agenda. It's not for you to come in here and I'm going to fix you and make you better for your family. I'm here to hear what you have to say. And that's it. I'm not on some trajectory of like how to make you do better in school or whatever it is your parents told me you're here for. I want to know what your goals are and what you want to get out of this. And a lot of the time, if it's, I don't have any goals, I'm being forced to be here, I won't take the case on because I'll tell the parents, it doesn't work like that. You know, we're going to be sitting in silence for a year. I've done it. And it's, all it's going to do is breed mistrust of therapy and they're never going to want to revisit it later in life. And that's the opposite of what I want. Right. Okay. So then you were saying too, that you needed to work on your own trauma. What helped you address your trauma? Obviously good therapy <laughs> was key, but I think that, you know, a lot of that work was forgiving my parents and reckoning with what my perception of myself was because there, that identity of being a bad kid was still in there and, and impacted how successful I thought I could be as a clinician and how much I felt worthy of even being in the room as a clinician, because who cares what I think was still a voice in there, you know, and it was mostly done in therapy. I do think that this movement, you know, the starting to talk about this stuff was a really pivotal point for me where I thought I had done all this work and was like, I'm over it. I'm good. And then people start talking about it and something that had once just been mine, like I could bring it up to my friends. They had never heard of it before. My story was the only perspective they had. Suddenly there's more and more voices contributing to the conversation beyond just mine. And initially I would have thought I would have like dived right into that and been so thankful for it and let me get in there and start talking. But my initial reaction was just to hide from it. Cause it's like, I don't know any other way to describe it except imposter syndrome is really what I felt. It was like, well, other people had worse experiences. Other people went through a lot more than I did. Let them talk. No one needs to hear from me. And I think, you know, a part of trauma we don't talk about is memory loss, right? So that's a huge piece too, where you doubt your own memories. Other people make you doubt your memories because for their own agenda. And it makes it really hard to heal and speak up and do any of this work because you're like, I don't even know if I'm remembering it right. And maybe it wasn't as bad as all that. And all these different voices come in. So I, I think weirdly, a, a huge part of all my healing has started in the last like two years because other people starting to talk about this brought up all this stuff in me that I thought I had worked on. 
I'm wondering just from what you've learned now with parents who might be listening to this, people who have teens who they're concerned about, what should they be, first of all, saying or doing with their teens that you think would be more helpful than sending them somewhere? But if they feel they need to, what should they be looking out for? I think it's a really difficult question because it's it's still something that should exist but doesn't. I work with so many parents who you know, again, in theory, this would be the next step, but then you go looking and researching and it's, it's these abusive facilities. It's not anything real. I think there's a huge gap, you know, um, this is a need that I wish someone legitimate would fill. I wish that some group of clinicians could come in and start revamping the way this industry works until then, you know, I, I, this is the question I ask over and over in my work as a clinician too. It's like, what do I tell them? How do I, because when you're at that point and you feel so helpless, your kid is headed down a path that seems really dangerous and there's nothing, there's no safety net. You know, it's they either fall and they have to learn that way, which is horrible or what, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think, obviously I think listening is really important, not trying not to take in sort of an adversarial approach where it's you versus them, but it's hard because they have to be willing to talk and, and want to open up. And sometimes they don't even have the language for that emotion. So I think, you know, I would say give therapy more of a shot maybe, because I think sometimes it's premature to like pull the kid out of therapy because they're not talking or it's been a year and we're not making any progress and maybe reframe your version of what therapy is because I've had success after two years, after three years, you know, even with kids who weren't talking that entire time and suddenly they get to a point and they feel safe and it starts to work, but it's definitely not push them into a room, please fix my kid. And then within six months, you're going to see results. That's just, that's not how it works. Being more patient and giving it more time than you would want to. And let the therapist educate you on why it's taking so long and, and what's going on and they know they're they're the clinician, so they can help explain it to you. So just as we're kind of wrapping this up, I, I want to make sure that you have a chance to talk if there are more stories that have kind of been embedded in your memory that really were pivotal that you want people to know about, feel free to, to share them now or if there are more insights that you wanted to share. Well, one of the other things I was going to say on the topic of you know parents is that I think sometimes the worst case feels like the end of the world, like let's say flunking out of school, right? And I know it's kind of a hard thing to hear and kind of a radical idea, but sometimes that's that's part of them having agency and autonomy over their life is a consequence to their action that they then have to dig themselves out of. You know, it's like, what now? I, I flunked out, I have to repeat a grade or I didn't get into colleges. What do I do? You know, and, and having to learn how to come back from that because I think just learning that you can get to the worst case or, you know, or, or just seeing something all the way through, right? Like if you stop doing your homework, let's see this all the way through, where does this end? It really can be transformative. I think for me, it really was. It was like getting to a place where I had flunked out of college. It, the worst had happened. Like everything my parents had predicted had happened. But just getting to that moment where the worst had happened and I got to make a decision of like, what do you do now? Do you follow this all the way through and go, that's your future? Or do you move back to California and try to do something differently? But that was my decision. And that was when I started to be able to turn everything around. So I think sometimes just, yeah, letting them kind of, unfortunately, go through with the thing that they're trying out to see where it lands. And then having to figure that out can be really important. First and foremost, it seems that it's important for people who have gone through these experiences to know that they don't have to stay silent, like breaking code silence. They don't need to keep the secrets of the people who did things wrong to them. But where can people connect with other people and where can parents learn from other people's experiences so they know to make better and safer decisions for their kids? Breaking Code Silence is obviously a huge resource. Um, BreakingCodeSilence.org is the or- the nonprofit organization. And that's where there's a lot of like groups and education and people telling their stories. And I think some Facebook groups have like come alive because of that and survivors starting to connect. That whole Breaking Code Silence thing movement has spread a lot of like offshoots and spaces for people to start to connect that did not exist before. And and I think Paris Hilton just starting to talk about it because she's someone who has a lot of wealth and can, you know, the litigious element of it 
isn't an issue, she can sort of fight through that, has opened a huge door because we have someone standing in front going like, you know, (laughs) I will deal with that element of it. You guys just tell your story. That has changed, in my perspective, has changed everything because I did not see these communities existing even two years ago that they do now. I thank you so much for sharing some of your stories. I know there are many more stories. And I know that your clients are lucky to have you with your insight, with your sense of really knowing, um, having been through it yourself. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you or find other interviews that you've done? Just to learn more about your story. So I just started an Instagram for this purpose. Um, So it's my name, Julianne Bull, LMFT on Instagram. Just getting the word out. It was a pleasure to speak with you. I know it's a difficult subject, but I'm so happy that you are now where you are in your life. And it's really, it's really good to see. Thank you. I appreciate it. And it's it's so nice to just have a, a forum to talk about it. One more thing before you go. Thank you so much, Julianne, for sharing your stories with us. As with all guests, they've had to narrow down how many stories to share. And with experiences that go on for years and experiences that are so intense, I know that there are hours and hours, days and days of stories. So thank you to Julianne for choosing some that really highlight her experiences. I know that it's a tough ask for me when I have people on the show to have them narrow it down to a few very powerful stories. So I appreciate the preparation and the work that that entails. One of the things that Julianne said that I want to be able to get back to, among a couple of other things that I want to be able to get back to, is she said, I stubborned my way out of it. I stubborned my way out of the program. I love that phrase. I love that she had put her foot down. I love that she had become defiant. I love that she had said no more. There was something inside of her that was rising up, that was making it more and more impossible for people to control her and for people to make her feel a certain way about herself and behave a certain way. That's a very powerful core. And what you hope is that you're in an environment that would support it, not negate it, not pathologize it. When someone tries to pathologize the part of you that's strong, the part of you that says, hey, wait a minute, Mm, no, then you have to wonder why. Why do they need to take that away? The problem that happens when people are so torn down, when people are so mistreated, is that they start to feel like they are bad people. They start to feel like they're not trustworthy. They start to feel like there's something really wrong with them. And so it didn't at all surprise me when she talked about how she has what she calls bad kid self-concept and that she has some memory loss from her time, which can often happen when you've gone through trauma, when you've also found yourself kind of happily and out of necessity dissociating, splitting off yourself to not be fully present because it's too hard to be. But it also really doesn't surprise me that she has what's called imposter syndrome, something I've talked about on the show in the past. When people don't feel qualified to do what they're doing, they don't feel like good people. They don't feel like the people they think other people see them as. They have imposter syndrome. People with low self-esteem will often feel imposter syndrome when someone pays them a compliment thinking that person just doesn't know them. That person is someone they've somehow fooled or tricked in order to get that compliment. It's a very sad state of being. And it's fine to have humility. But when it goes as far as being this imposter syndrome, then you run the risk of not being able to take in any affirmation or compliment, any confirmation that you are a good person or that you're doing good things or that you're capable or that you're kind, or that you're anything you were told you weren't. The part that I want to be able to address before we finish up today is something that we haven't talked, I think, enough about on this show, which is when she said, they don't prepare you for living again with the people who sent you there. That was extremely powerful. And yeah, 
They don't. They don't prepare you because they are coming from a place of feeling like what they're doing to you is perfectly fine. And so because they're not really doing a lot that they want to take responsibility for, then they're not going to acknowledge that what they're doing is wrong or could have been damaging. And then they're not going to make a link back to your families and others who sent you there and give you tools to figure out how to handle being with people who sent you to a place that wound up hurting you and traumatizing you. So how do you do it? How do you figure out how to live again with the people who sent you there? And one of the things that I think is really important is for you to have a sense to a great degree that parents will often or caregivers will often send kids there because they feel really stuck. They feel like they're out of ideas and they're out of choices. And with some healthy organizations, they made a good decision to send you to a place that really could help you. But with others that are not healthy, they didn't send you to an unhealthy place on purpose. If the teen treatment place that turned out to be a troubled teen treatment place sent your parents a brochure or had a website that showed how things really were, I doubt parents would send their kids there. So they're not able to make a fully educated decision. They're not able to decide if it is healthy or not. They just are not given the information. And some of these places are so glossy. And some of these places are really good at convincing parents that this is going to be the answer. This is going to help them get their kid back, whatever that means. But the part, though, that I think is important here as well, that I want to make sure to mention before finishing today, is that it's not just on the kids' shoulders to figure out how to live again with the people who sent you there. It's for the people who sent you there to be able to acknowledge that they sent you to a place that turned out to be really harmful and scary and traumatizing. It doesn't make you a weaker parent to acknowledge it. In fact, it makes you a very loving, strong parent where you can be angry alongside your child about what this place pretended to be and what it promised to be that it never planned to deliver. And you can be angry alongside your child about the crimes that were committed there, about the things that were covered up that you just could not find out about, even if you tried to a great degree. And you can also say, let's figure out how to heal together. And we acknowledge And we apologize and we will make sure that if you're ever having trouble again, that we'll go over ideas with you. We'll decide on a place that feels right for you with you. There is something about being sent to a place that you had no say over and having your rights taken away while you're there. And then on top of it, it not being a healthy place that ultimately makes you feel so powerless. And the parents also, at the end of the day, are powerless because they're not given the information they need to protect you. So parents, if you're listening, it is important for you to acknowledge it's not your fault, but there's something you participated in that did end up hurting your child. And one of the most strengthening things for a child is to hear a parent apologize and to not end it with, but (laughs) I'm sorry, but mm, you know, It did help a little. Mm, Just say, I'm sorry. But also link arms with your child in terms of their healing, helping them get better, and they will trust you more. They'll be able to heal better if you really do acknowledge what happened, even though your intentions were pure. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.